while you slept last night, it came. The snows of Christmas. These are the first pictures of Christmas 1989. Shortly after midnight, with the temperature about 20 degrees, there was just enough moisture in the air to make it happen. It's Christmas in Bucharest, and the government is falling. 20 years of brutal dictatorship and almost 50 years of authoritarian socialism has come to this. Its leader begging the people for mercy whilst his palace gets stormed. But how did it get to this point? And what happened next? Meet the Ceausescus. Dictator husband Nicolae and his devoted wife, Elena. Together, they ran the Socialist Republic of Romania from the mid-60s until the end of our story. His government was underpinned by extreme brutality and an undying sense of control. Partly inspired by the North Koreans, they set about constructing an absurd cult of personality within the country, making the image of himself and his wife paramount to national identity. During her time as Deputy Prime Minister, Eleanor would spend a great deal of it trying to get a PhD in chemistry. With plagiarised articles, ghost-written essays, and assistance from her husband, she was able to get one, though not without attracting scorn. Romanian chemists began to band about a nickname for her based on her mispronunciation of carbon dioxide, Kodoi, doi being the Romanian word for two. The country spent a great deal of time playing both sides of the Cold War off one another. Romania tried to fashion itself as a middleman between the east and west of the Iron Curtain, with varying successes to those in charge. The country, while part of the Warsaw Pact, acted in its own interests, and not for the wider blocs, notably refusing to invade Czechoslovakia in 1968, and playing a major part in Israel-Palestine negotiations, in both cases going completely against the Soviet Union's wishes. Outside of this, the country had become an unspeakable hell for its people. The secret police, known as the Securitat, tapped everything of importance in what was considered to be one of the biggest and most invasive secret polices in history. Most notably, they transcribed almost every phone conversation that happened in the country during the period. 1984 had come to Romania in the late 1970s. In the midst of this public crackdown came financial hardship. Romania's act of playing the field had resulted in larger loans from the international community that needed to be paid off. The workers bore the brunt of the debt, while the Shashaskus continued to enjoy a life of luxury, expense and excess. With this in mind, the Romanian Revolution of 1989 seemed inevitable. It still would have to be the perfect storm of events, however, to get the ball rolling. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that's exactly what happened. A while ago, astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. The Eastern Bloc as a whole was incensed and ready to tear away the brutal dictatorships holding them back. Romania, like many countries in the Eastern Bloc, had publicly repressed religion. As a result, it is hard to see and hard to believe that at the same time as this, it was Christmas in the West. BBC Television's Story of Christmas. By the 17th, these protests that had been taking place across Romania turned into a violent battle on the streets between the Union of anti shishescu Sentiment, the National Salvation Front, and the government's loyal Securitate forces. The revolution became a nationwide issue in mere days, with the city of Timisoara becoming the first to be liberated on the 20th. December the 21st marks Shishescu's last official address to the people. 
In widely circulated video footage, you can see Ceausescu deliver a message to the people, claiming stability and ensuring safety. Le vostre participantilor la această mare adunare populare, tuturor locuitorilor municipiului București, un salut călduros revoluționar împreună cu cele mai bune urări de succes în toate domeniile de activitate. Să vă informez pe dumneavoastră de o importantă hotărâre adoptată în această zi de la 1 ianuarie să majorăm în cursul anului viitor retribuția minimă de la 2000 la 2200 lei. Cea... Doresc de asemenea să adresez mulțumiri inițiatorilor și organizatorilor acestei mare manifestări populare din București, considerând aceasta ca o By the 22nd, many had begun to leave Ceausescu's side, citing the death of a military minister that was later ruled to be a suicide, but at the time was believed to have been the handiwork of the regime. Almost all of Ceausescu's most loyal supporters had switched sides to the NSF. The NSF, in fact, was actually headed by a former Communist Party apparatchik, Ion Ialescu. We'll hear more about him later. Nikolai is stuck inside of the Central Committee building, when eventually, protesters and revolutionaries enter through an unguarded open door. After making a rushed escape by helicopter, they are eventually stopped and taken to a military base in Targovishta. And with that, the Ceausescu reign is over. Ialescu, the head of the NSF, is now the leader of the country. And with the Ceausescu's in captivity, he is left with a very tricky choice. Ialescu advocated for a trial of the Ceausescu's seeing it as being in keeping with the revolutionary wish for democracy and freedom. A free society would therefore grant a free trial, even to the worst of its people. Many other members of the NSF, however, preferred an outright execution of the pair. What followed as a result was the worst of both worlds. Christmas morning, 1989. A Romanian lawyer by the name of Nicu Tudorescu was having breakfast with his family when suddenly he got a phone call from the military base in Targovishta. He promptly makes his way from his breakfast table to the makeshift courtroom in Targovishta. In later years, the lawyer that took the role remarked that he considered what was asked of him an interesting challenge that he couldn't refuse. He was asked to participate in a show trial that Stalin would have been proud of. The trial was televised on both Romanian and Austrian television, and was translated by the US Foreign Broadcasting Service in a matter of weeks. The following summary is derived from this translation. Nikolai opens by saying that he will recognise only the Grand National Assembly, a point that he repeats frequently within the trial, particularly when he's asked any questions. The prosecutor begins with an emphatic description of the poor living conditions of Romanian citizens that have arguably been caused by Ceausescu's rule. After Nikolai continues to refuse the court's authority, the prosecutor begins to talk about issues in Timisoara, particularly the shooting of crowds. The accusation of genocide of 60,000 people is levelled. Nikolai continues not listening to the court, calling those organising it putschists. Eleanor occasionally chimes in with whispers to Nikolai. The prosecution asks Ceausescu directly why he, quote, ruined the country, end quote mentioning that peasantry have starved as a result of his austerity programs to pay off foreign debt. Nikolai mentions that he, as a regular Romanian citizen, is equal to everyone else, and that he has tried to create a decent and rich life for everyone. This claim is immediately disputed by the prosecutor. The pair are quizzed about Swiss bank accounts, which they fervently deny. No evidence of the Swiss bank accounts have actually surfaced since the trial ended. After this, the genocide question is mentioned again, followed by a brutal dissection of Eleanor's supposed academic prowess. 
They are then both asked whether they have a mental illness, which even the prosecutor suggests would help their case. Not long after, the court finds the pair guilty of multiple penal code violations and sentences them to death. The defence counsel finally speaks and, in a surprising act, turns against the Shishescus. He says that they are, quote, guilty even if they do not want to admit it, and that they should be tried for offences stemming the entirety of their rule, and not just offences related to the last few weeks. However, the counsel also asks for a fair legal trial in accordance with international law. The prosecutor emotively dismisses this, and the following occurs. Minutes later, they are led outside and shot. Part of the execution was taped and sent for television transmission around the world. These images, however, will not be shown in this documentary, as they serve no true artistic point other than garish, morbid curiosity. Instead, more poignantly, this is the grave that they were thrown into without any consideration for who they once were. Days later, in the burgeoning state of Romania, the death penalty is made officially illegal. He was the last man to be executed on modern European soil. The show trial and execution raises important moral questions. Is it more ethically justifiable to let evil such as Ceausescu rot away in prison? Should he and his wife have a fair day in court? And what justification should you arguably need for disposing of a despot? These questions are asked time and time again, and there are many ways to argue it with level-headed justification for both. However, this case may stand as an example that the ends may have justified the means. 29 years on, and Romania is truly free for the first time in its history. Many generations will now live free, wealthier lives in a democracy, with the freedom to celebrate the holiday period without the worry of a knock on the door from the Securitat. Some will remember this Christmas for more than the snow. This is Dick Curtis reporting. Report, 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 report.